Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Sri Lanka has a new president and is Ranel Vikramasinghe. But the key question is, is he the right man for the job? Is he a hidden savior in disguise or is he in fact a disastrous choice? That's the key issue I shall raise today with the executive director of Sri Lanka Center for Policy Alternatives, Dr. Paikasoti Saravanamuttu. Dr. Saravanamuttu, let's start by the enormous scale of Ranel Vikramasinghe's victory. He got 134 out of 219 valid votes, which means that something like 61% of MPs who were voting voted for him. And he had 52 votes more than Dallas Alaha Paruma, who came second. Did you expect that he would win with such a wide margin? No, I thought the race would have been much closer, particularly when Sajid Premadasa came out and supported Dallas Alaha Peruma. I thought that with the Pohutu or the SLPP votes splitting, that together with the opposition votes, that Dallas Alaha Peruma would certainly have run a much closer race. So it's very clear that the Sri Lanka, Pudujana Perumura, and the SLPP members of parliament have put their faith in Vanil Vikramasinghe because they are, I think, afraid of their security. They feel that he will provide strong government that any kind of confrontation with the protests, etc., that they will be protected. I'll come in a moment's time to the challenges he faces because he has hideous problems to contend with as president. But first, let me ask you, is this an ambition fulfilled for Ranil Vikramasinghe? He stood twice before to become president and failed on both occasions. Now he's got it, albeit through a sort of back door. But is it an ambition fulfilled? Perhaps it is. Perhaps it is an ambition fulfilled in that, as you said, he contested the presidency twice. And then as the leader of the United National Party on two separate occasions, he did not contest at all. So, yes, I suppose it is an ambition fulfilled, but it's an ambition fulfilled in order to be able to save the country from the economic collapse that it is facing. So he has to come up with a number of policies that will help to mount the political and economic challenge. I think he must talk about the abolition of the executive presidency. I think he must give us a timetable with regard to elections. We must move ahead with the staff agreement with the IMF. And he has to resolve the immediate problem of the queues for fuel, for petrol, and also for the shortages of medical supplies and very importantly, food. I'll come to each of those issues you mentioned in a moment's time, but let me first begin with the fact that he is an unpopular man in the eyes of the protesters. As far as they are concerned, he's almost as unpopular as Gotabe Rajapaksa. They, at all costs, did not want him as president. How will they now respond to his election and the fact that he's won quite convincingly? Well, the expectation has always been that the Argale or the protest movement, the struggle, as it were, will continue. It will intensify. Now, as to what exactly that will be in terms of where will they demonstrate, what will they demonstrate against, apart from saying that Rani Vikramasinghe should resign and go, is all debatable. But there may well be a certain section of the Aragale who sort of says, look, 
let's give him a bit of time. Let's see what he comes up with. But I think, by and large, the determination of the Aragalea, their reputation of having stuck to their positions and having succeeded as far as the fulfillment of their demands are concerned, is very strong. So we might have more tension and the possibility of confrontation. If the Aragale, the protests continue and even intensify, as you suggested, could happen, how will Ranil Vikramasinghe as president respond? I notice that Sri Lanka is presently under a national emergency. Might he respond forcefully? After all, not so long ago, he referred to the protesters as fascists. He's even called them rioters. So might he be tempted now that he is president and he has a clear two years and four months in office to respond forcefully to try and impose peace by getting the army or the police out? Yes, he has identified certain sections of the Aragalea as being fascists, and he has said that they should not use violence, and that if they use violence, he's given the army orders to do whatever is necessary to ensure that the institutions of democracy are protected. So it's quite possible that if there is violence, if the, if the protesters, if the Aragalea marches on parliament or does something like that, if there is additional violence in terms of burning and all of those kinds of things, and that could well have been infiltrated by the security forces, then yes, he could turn the army out on them, and then we could have very serious repercussions. So as far as the protesters are concerned, if the protests continue and intensify, we could have a battle on our hands on the streets of Colombo? Potentially, yes. Now, the other serious problem he faces is getting his legislation passed in Parliament. His party had only one seat. He occupied it himself. Now that he's become president, I presume someone else in his party will get that seat. But doesn't it mean that he's going to be completely dependent on the SLPP and their majority to pass legislation? Absolutely. He is there because of SLPP votes. And he must have had to come to some sort of an arrangement with them that once he becomes president, that they would agree to support him to do certain things. We don't know what those certain things are. Presumably, they will support him with regard to the discussions with the IMF, getting to the staff agreement, etc. They will support him if there is a possibility of violent confrontation out on the streets and restoring law and order. Beyond that, with regard to reducing the powers of the presidency or indeed abolishing the presidency, my guess is, is that they will not think about that at all. But so if he, in terms of, sorry, please carry on. In terms of the political reforms that the Aragalea is talking about and many of us in civil society are also talking about, we may not get any progress as such. But if he's dependent upon the SLPP to get legislation passed in parliament, does that also mean he's now dependent on the Raja Paksas for the success of his presidency? Because I notice both Mahinda and his son Namal were present in parliament today and presumably voted for him. Is his yeah. dependence on the Raja Paksas going to be a, a liability for him, particularly in the eyes of the protesters who anyway believe He's a savior for the Raja Paksas rather than a ruler of the country. And the protesters also believe that this parliament is totally unrepresentative and we need a fresh mandate and therefore they are demanding elections as soon as possible. Yes, he will have to rely on the support of the SLPP. And to the extent that the SLPP majority in parliament is still under the control of the Raja Paksas, yes, he will have to therefore depend on the Raja Paksas. So this means, as far as the world outside is concerned, Ranil Vikramasinghe's election is not a solution to the crisis. It's just a stepping stone, and we don't know whether the crisis will continue or intensify or what sort of turn it might take. We simply don't know at this point. It's an interim measure which does not resolve the overarching questions of political stability in order to get the economy right and systemic change. It's an interim measure, and yes, it is clouded by the prospect of violence and confrontation. Now, I noticed that in the speech he made in Parliament shortly after his election, he reached out to everyone. He took their names personally. And in particular, he reached out to Sajid Premadasa, who is, I believe, the official leader of the opposition. How will they respond at this moment of crisis? 
because that is the truth about the situation Sri Lanka faces. Will they be prepared in Sri Lanka's interest to put their rivalries and their personal clashes behind and cooperate with Ranil Vikramasinghe? Or do they dislike him so much that in fact their rivalries will come to the fore? But as far as I understand it, the SJB says that it will support whatever government is there in order to get the economy right. However, politically, they were saying that they wanted the abolition of the presidency, they wanted fresh elections. So that's a question now that Sajid Premadasa and the SJB will have to answer. What are they going to do in the next two years and four months to get rid of the government before the constitutional stipulated timetable for elections comes about? I'll come that is a challenge to them. I'll come to the economic crisis in a moment's time, but before I come to that, let me ask you about the other important demand from the point of view of op the opposition leaders and also from the point of view of the protesters, the abolition of the executive presidency. Now, Ranil as prime minister from 215 to 219 passed a constitutional amendment, the 19th amendment, which reduced the powers of the presidency considerably, but it was reversed by the Rajapaksas with the 20th Amendment. Now that Ranil himself is the executive president, will he take steps to reduce his own powers, as presumably he is committed to do, or will he say that the priority is the economic problem, not the political issues, and therefore find ways of hanging on to his powers? Certainly, if he's unpopular, his powers will be of great assistance to him, and he may not want to lose them. Well, when he was running for president for the election today, he did say that he would bring back the 19th Amendment. And there is a greater likelihood that he would bring back the 19th Amendment rather than come up with the abolition of the executive presidency. So we hope that he will keep his word and that the 19th Amendment will be passed. But the 19th Amendment, whilst it's much better than the current situation, it is not satisfactory in terms of the demands of the Aragale and in terms of the requirements of democratic governance in the country. So even though bringing back the 19th Amendment is a measure that would be welcome, it doesn't go far enough for the Aragale or the protesters. They will feel dissatisfied. They will feel he hasn't kept the promise. Yes, certainly it would be much better than him not doing anything. But the idea is that the Aragale has is that the presidency must go. Let's then at this point come to the state of the economy, because the economic crisis, I presume most people would agree, is the primary crisis Sri Lanka faces. Out of the three choices that Sri Lanka had this morning for president, would you say that Ranil Vikramasinghe, from the point of view of handling the crisis, was the best? He's, after all, been prime minister six times. Dallas Alaparuma has only been a minister for a couple of years and he has no real administrative experience. And the third gentleman who's head of the JVP has no administrative experience at all. So out of the three, from the point of view of the economic crisis, was Ranil the best choice to handle that crisis? Well, Ranil has had and has, does have the experience and the expertise to deal with the economic crisis. However, what he lacks is the political credibility and the trust and confidence of the people in the country. So externally, he is thought of well, I think, in terms of his expertise and experience to deal with the economy. But politically at home, that's where his problem is, is winning the trust and confidence of the people and carrying them along with him when it comes to making the agreement with the IMF and beginning to implement it. So what you're saying is that as a six-time former prime minister, he knows what's to be done. He can identify the tough, difficult medicine that has to be swallowed, but he lacks the credibility, and he lacks the popularity to convince the country that the medicine is necessary. So he may Absolutely. know what to do, but he can't sell his package to the country. Yes, and so therefore he will have to have in his cabinet either it is from the SLPP or from elsewhere in terms of an all-party cabinet, people who are good communicators who will go out and tell the people what we are doing, why we are doing, and, you know, get their legitimacy behind the government to take the necessary steps. 
No doubt critical members of the SLPP, the Rajapaksa party will join his cabinet, but will the SJB, the Sajid Premadasa party, join him? Will he also reach out to the smaller Tamil parties? Well, he will reach out to everyone, as he has said. But I doubt whether the SJB will, whether Sajid Premadasa will join it, and as to whether he will allow his members to join it, maybe they can break away and join it. That's a possibility. I don't think the Tamil National Alliance will, although there is one MP from the Tamil National Alliance who has said that if the government is serious about constitutional reform, that they may consider joining it, almost certainly that they will support it. So forming a truly national all-party government is going to be pretty difficult for him. And if he cannot get the Sajid Premadasa group of 50-odd MPs to join him, then a very sizable 25% almost of parliament will not be part of his government. Yes, that is entirely possible. But I think the real challenge to him is not the parliamentary opposition, but it is rather the opposition in the streets, the Aragadev. And that's where he lacks the charm, he lacks the charisma, he lacks the personality to reach out to them. He doesn't have exactly. the requisite talent or skill to handle the most serious problem, which is his unpopularity. Yeah, that certainly seems to be what is on record at the moment. Tell me, how will his election as president go down with the IMF? Sri Lanka is very keen on a package from the IMF. Ranil Vikramasinghe has let it be known that there is a degree of understanding, although he gave no further details. How would it go down with the World Food Programme? And how would it go down with critical important countries in the West, like the United States and the United Kingdom? How will this package of important institutions and countries view Ranil Vikramasinghe's presidency? In terms of the experience and the expertise, that they would like to see from the Sri Lankan government's side, I think there will be no questions. They would accept Ranil Vikramasinghe as the president and as the representative of the government of Sri Lanka. However, if there is continuing instability in the country because he is president, then there will be problems. Any negotiations, any conversations will be derailed or delayed, most definitely. The question that Ranil Vikramasinghe has has always been the question of political credibility, political popularity, earning the trust and confidence of the people of Sri Lanka. Now, in terms of the economy, do we know what he plans to do now that he's become the president of the country with all the powers of that very important office? Has he a plan of action in mind that he shared with anyone? Or will he simply continue with the policies he followed as prime minister for the last two months? Well, I think it will be a continuation of the policies he followed as Prime Minister for the last two months, because those will also go into the uh, staff agreement with the IMF. And what are we talking about? We're talking about raising taxes. We're talking about considering getting rid of the state-owned enterprises that are making losses by the millions daily. We're talking about no further recruitment as far as the public sector is concerned. And we're also talking about cutting that single largest budget line item that eclipses both health and education, that's military spending. So I think all of those things will go into his, the policy program of his government and into the agreement with the IMF. My last question. I imagine from everything you said to me that the next month or six weeks is critical for Ranil Vikramasinghe. That's when he will know how he is to handle the protesters and whether he can calm their anger. That's also when he'll know whether he'll get the requisite support in parliament for his legislation and to create a national government. What do you think will be the likely situation facing your country four weeks or six weeks from now? Or is it impossible to look down the road? Well, it's a bit too early to give a definitive answer to that question because He's just been elected, what, two hours ago or whatever. But if the Aragalia decides that it's going to intensify and that it is going to set a new goal of getting rid of him as fast as possible, then we are in for a very critical period in which there will be tension and the possibility of confrontation and violence in the streets. So the next couple of weeks is critical for Sri Lanka. 
and it's equally Absolutely. critical for Ranil Vikramasinghe. His future could depend on it. His future could depend on it, but our future as a country will depend on it. Dr. Sarvanamuthu, thank you very much for joining me today and explaining how you view Ranil Vikramasinghe's election as the new president of Sri Lanka. Take care. Good luck. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Karan. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.